University Malaysia Kelantan UMK is an entrepreneurial university. We implement the government's aspiration to ensure the younger generation are not only highly educated but also entrepreneurial. UMK is the number one entrepreneurial university in Malaysia and aspires to be one of the world best by 2030. This is in line with the National Entrepreneurship Policy, which aims to make Malaysia an entrepreneurial country by 2030. According to this vision, UMK ensures the whole university functions within an entrepreneurial ecosystem. This ecosystem comprises nine faculties, supported by institutes and centers of excellence implemented with the discipline of innovation-based entrepreneurship. The university's upper management, together with UMK employees at all levels, are committed to realizing UMK as a Malaysian public university well respected for its foundation of entrepreneurship. Implementing this ecosystem, the UMK Entrepreneurship Institute, UMKEI, oversees three other entrepreneurship-based centres. The Centre for Entrepreneurship Development and Education, CEED. The Institute of Small and Medium Enterprises, ISME. And the Global Entrepreneurship Research and Innovation Centre, GERIC. The Faculty of Entrepreneurship and Business spearheading this structure has successfully developed collaborative entrepreneurial networks such as UMK Frontier Street, Entrepreneurship Advisory Council, and proudly led the Committee for Ministry of Higher Education Guide to Entrepreneurship Integrated Education. From the academic aspect, UMK offers 25 undergraduate programs and 16 postgraduate programs in the fields of business and management, tourism and hospitality, science and technology, as well as arts and heritage. The university is constantly enhancing its teaching and learning system to ensure that the process of learning takes place creatively and innovatively through my academic integrated system, my AIS, Massive Open Online Courses, MOOC, and Blended Learning. UMK is committed to the development of first-class graduates to become the leaders of the industry. Collaboration with world-class local corporate sectors, as well as a network of well-known regional education institutions, is aimed at empowering UMK from various angles. This is evidenced by the increase in the marketability of graduates and graduates who create businesses. Research, innovation and commercialization is another important part of UMK. Research funding and the number of innovations and commercialized products increase every year. UMK has performed well in various prestigious competitions. With the hashtag UMK for Society, UMK is also involved in various community activities. Our staff and students consistently demonstrate outstanding skills and abilities. With such a great spirit of teamwork, UMK has never looked back to emerge as a respected educational entity in the region. We at UMK believe that our presence will give a new look to the development of the Valley of Knowledge. Indeed, our core entrepreneurship will always make us University Malaysia Kelantan relevant, unique and different.
Assalamualaikum and a very good morning to all. Welcome to the opening ceremony of the Tech Asia Pacific Regional Conference on Food Security, ACOF 2021. Ladies and gentlemen, to begin with, I would like to call upon Yang Berusaha, Mr. Muhammad Khalid El Muhammadi for the recitation. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Alhamdulillahi alladhi bi ni'mati tatimma salihat. Wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulina al-amin wa ala alihi wa ashabihi ajma'in. Ya Allah, ya fa'alu lima yurid. We express our gratitude to you for following us to attend the launching ceremony of ARCOF, Third Asia Pacific Regional Conference on Food Security 2021 on this auspicious morning. Ya Allah, we ask you for the safety of our religion and the welfare of our body. O Allah, Lord of the implementing authority, make the days that we've gone through starting with your mercy, continue with your blessing and end it with the forgiveness. And also make the days that we've gone through with guidance and end with the victory of excellence. Ya Allah, Ya Muhaymin, Ya Aziz, Ya Jabbar. Let our efforts as a means to enlighten and convince ourselves that the personal safety of either outer or inner is a prerequisite for achieving happiness and excellence in various fields. O oh Allah, grant us faith and strength in order to face the challenges in life during the transition period and in the face of life in this new millennium. Ya Allah, Ya Farij al-Ham, Ya Waqashif al-Ham. Ya Allah, show us guidance and adjust our path and ways to achieve happiness and glory. Let us listen to people who like the good things. Let us avoid doing the bad and evil things. O oh Allah, bless us up our life in this meeting and conventions and prevent us from harm and unfortunate events. ربنا آتنا في الدنيا حسنة وفي الآخرة حسنة وقنا عذاب النار الحمد لله رب العالمين. Thank you, Mr. Muhammad Khalid. As most of you are aware, we have lost our beloved colleague recently. He was one of the founders of the Asia Pacific Regional Conference on Food Security. Let's take a minute of silence to remember the late Associate Professor Dr. Muhammad Amizi bin Ayub al Fatiha. Your memories live on forever in our hearts. Yang Berhormat, Datuk Haji Cik Abdullah bin Matnawi, Deputy Minister of Agriculture and Food Industries Malaysia. Yang Berbahagia, Professor Dr. Nik Mazuki bin Siddiq, Dean, Faculty of Agribase Industry, University Malaysia Kelantan, as the advisor of ARCOF 2021. Yang Berusaha, Dr. Nur Hafizah Saidan, Chairman of ARCOF 2021. Yang berbahagia, Professor Datin Paduka Dr. Fatima binti Muhammad Arshad, keynote speaker of ARCOF 2021 from Institute of Agriculture and Food Policy Studies, University Putra, Malaysia. All plenary speakers, all representatives, participants, ladies and gentlemen, welcome again to the third Asia Pacific Regional Conference on Food Security. Of 2021. First and foremost, on behalf of the organizing committee, I would like to extend our warmest welcome to our distinguished keynote speaker, invited speakers, presenters, participants, ladies and gentlemen. It is a great pleasure to have all of you joining us here on this occasion virtually. Ladies and gentlemen, the objective of ARCOP 2021 is to provide
food security professionals in the Asia-Pacific region with a platform to exchange the latest information on sustainable food production to identify mega trends that influence food security and to recognize the main indicators of food insecurity and plan for proactive strategies for food security sector. We are hoping that this conference can be a platform for all players to discuss the research development, latest technology, and innovation in the related field. For your information, the presentation for today's conference will feature both synchronous and asynchronous, which includes 90 paper presentations. The sessions will be held in several parallel sessions based on the field and scopes. Please refer to the provided program book for the details. Ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, I would like to invite Yang Berbahagia, Professor Dr. Nick Mazuki bin Siddiq, Dean of Faculty of Agro-Based Industry, UMK, to deliver his welcoming remark. Please welcome. Thank you, Dr. Nordini. Ya, Muhammad Dr. Haji Cik Abdullah bin Manawi, Deputy Minister of Agriculture and Food Industries, Malaysia. Ya, Rubahagia, Professor Technologist Dr. Arham Abdullah, Deputy Vice Chancellor Research and Innovation University of Malaysia Kelantan Yang Berusaha Dr. Nur Hafizah Saidan Chairman of ARCOF 2021 Our Distinguished Keynote Speaker Plenary Speakers and Participants Assalamualaikum and very good day I am delighted to be given this opportunity by organizer to welcome all the speakers and participants to the third ARCOF conference. Unfortunately, we are unable to meet physically due to COVID-19 pandemic, but as we, as we have been communicated virtually for almost a year, it should be okay right now. Everything is now online. Online class, online meeting, even business is now online. Ladies and gentlemen, this conference was initiated almost seven years ago as a platform to discuss issues pertaining to the food security, including research, business, and management. I am very sure that participants will get benefit from the network that have been created. I would like to thank our organizer, co-organizers from various countries, and sponsors who work very hard to make this event success. Thank you. Terima kasih. Thank you, Yang Berbahagia Prof, for the speech. Now, I would like to invite Yang Berusaha Dr. Nur Hafizah Saidan, Chairman of ARCOF 2021, to deliver her welcoming speech. Please welcome. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum and welcome to the third Asia Pacific Regional Conference on Food Security, ARCOF 2021. I would like to take this golden opportunity to welcome Prof. Dr. Nim Azuki Ben Siddiq, Dean, Faculty of Agro-Based Industry, University of Malaysia, Kelantan, as advisor for ARCOF 2021, respected Deputy Minister of Agriculture and Food Industries, Malaysia, Yang Berhormat Datuk Haji Cik Abdullah bin Mat Nawi, who will be officiating ARCOF 2021 Keynote speaker, Yang Berbahagia, Prof. Datin Paduka, Dr. Fatimah binti Muhammad Ashad, plenary speakers, presenters, participants, ladies and gentlemen. This is our first virtual conference organized by the Faculty of Agro-Based Industry, University Malaysia, Kelantan. I would like to thank our Vice Chancellor, Yang Berbahagia, Prof. Datuk Technologist Dr. Noor Azizi bin Ismail for his support. To our co-organizers, Institute of Food Security and Sustainable Agriculture Malaysia, International Institute of Plantation Management Malaysia, Vikrama Sihapuri University India, Universitas Bogor Indonesia, Bangladesh Agricultural University Bangladesh, and Princess of Naradiwas University Thailand. Your commitments and contributions are highly appreciated. 
to our sponsors, your financial contribution have made this conference as a success. The last few months have been challenging for us, for our families, for industry, for nation, and for the world due to the COVID-19 pandemic. Challenges present opportunities. For a researcher, we explore our research work by providing more values for sustainable agri-food production and accelerating green innovation. Hence, the conference team is collaboration for regional food security, opportunities and challenges is much justified as it reflects the urgent need to seriously address and find concrete solutions to the many issues regarding food security. At this conference, we have gathered almost 100 participants from Malaysia and international countries in Asia Pacific, such as India, Bangladesh, Indonesia, and Thailand, who will be deliberating on food security in four different scopes, which are food security and climate change, sustainable agrotechnology, alternative agro-product development, and environmental economics. As a chairman of the conference, I wish to record my special thanks to the committee members for their tireless work to make ARCOF 2021 a resounding success. We apologize for any shortcoming. Please enjoy the session through active participation by contributing your ideas and insight. Thank you and enjoy the conference. Thank you, Yang Berzaha, Dr. Nur Hafizov, for the welcoming speech. Ladies and gentlemen, now, I am delighted to invite Yang Perhormat Dr. Haji Che Abdullah bin Matnawi, Deputy Minister of Agriculture and Food Industries Malaysia, to deliver his speech and to officiate ARCOF 2021. Please welcome. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh and good morning. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. Alhamdulillah, all praise be to Allah, the merciful, the all beneficent, by whose grace and blessings have enabled us. It is a great honor for me to be given the opportunity to officiate the launching of the third Asia Pacific Regional Conference on Food Security, ARCOFS 2021, which is held virtually this year due to pandemic COVID-19. The current pandemic issues of COVID-19 does not stop us from doing research and exchange our findings in the related topics of food security. My heartiest congratulations to the organizer, faculty of Agro-Based Industry, University of Malaysia, Kelantan, UMK, and co-organizers, including Institute of Food Security and Sustainable Agriculture, IFSSA, Malaysia, International Institute of Plantation Management, IIPM Malaysia, Vikrama Simhapuri University, India, Universitas Bogo, Indonesia, Bangladesh Agricultural University, Bangladesh, and the Princess of Naradiwas University, Thailand, for their dedication to make this conference a reality. On behalf of the Malaysian government, I wish all conference speakers and participants a very warm welcome to the third Asia Pacific Regional Conference on Food Security, ARCOFS 2021. The ARCOFS 2021 aims to provide food security professionals in the Asia Pacific region with a platform to exchange the latest information on sustainable food production, identify mega trends that influence food security, and recognize the major food indicators in security and plan for proactive strategies for the food security sector. It is suitable for the four major scopes covered in this conference, which are sustainable agrotechnology, food security and climate change, alternative agro products development, and environmental economics fields. The ARCOFS 2021 is a very useful platform to share and disseminate knowledge create awareness, promote understanding and generate new ideas, as well as opportunities for academia, researchers, entrepreneurs, policymakers, local and international experts to exchange relevant research results, innovative ideas, recent advances, as well as promote research collaborations 
through the plenary sessions and oral presentation sessions. Distinguish, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, more people are becoming aware of, of the issues in the food security nowadays because of COVID-19. It is a global issue that caused many countries to strive in an effort to optimize natural resources. This is to ensure that the agricultural sector remains functioning as usual in supplying sufficient quality food at reasonable prices and consumers can access raw supplies at the time of movement control and loss of income sources. We need to take the opportunity of this COVID-19 crisis to increase domestic production, especially from the agri agricultural and food sectors. This will indirectly reduce the country's depend dependence on food imports and ensure the sustainability of food security. We urgently need more producers, higher productivity per given unit, safer products for consumption, and more efficient distribution. Besides innovation, diversification, and nutritional standards must be enhanced. We need to put more emphasis on the education of consumerism, especially concerning food wastage. We also need to continuously remind our food growers and manufacturers to give due attention to environmental pollution and soil degradation. I strongly believe that our collaborative efforts as manifested in ARCOFS 2021 will bear some concrete results with strong commitment. The government of Malaysia certainly will continue to support all forms of initiatives taken by the stakeholders in food security, be it in research and development, be it in research and development programs, technology transfer, or innovation that may lead to strengthening food security and minimize the threats regarding food security. I am confident that this ARCOFS 2021 will address the urgent issues at hand and significantly contribute to our understanding of food security determinants. We are indeed fortunate to have a distinguished list of speakers, moderators, and panelists who will provide us with the necessary information, insights, and strategies when deliberating on the conference's issues. Indeed, conference proves beyond doubt that we can always collaborate and work towards our common goals during this very challenging time. I wish all the organizers and participants a very successful ARCOFS 2021, and may your virtual conference be a memorable one. With that note, I declare the third Asia-Pacific Regional Conference on Food Security ARCOFS 2021 open. Thank you. Thank you very much, Yang Berhormat Datuk Haji C. Abdullah bin Maknawi, for the speech. Ladies and gentlemen, ARCOF 2021 is now officially started. We will continue this virtual conference with keynote speech by Yang Berbahagia, Professor Datin Paduka, Dr. Fatima binti Muhammad Arshad. Ladies and gentlemen, for that, I will hand over the floor to Yang Berusaha, Mr. Muhammad Mahmud, lecturer from Faculty of Agro-Based Industry, University of Malaysia, Kelantan, to chair this keynote session. The floor is yours, Mr. Muhammad. Uh, all right, thank you very much, uh, Madam Chairperson. Assalamualaikum and very good morning to honorable guests, uh, distinguished speakers, respected participants, ladies and gentlemen. Um, welcome to the third Asia Pacific Regional Conference on Food Security, uh, ARCOFS 2021. My name is Muhammad from the Faculty of Agribusiness Industry, University of Malaysia Kelantan, will be the moderator for the session. Um, this morning, we are going to have a keynote presentation with a distinguished figure in agriculture and food security, Professor Datin Paduka uh, Fatima Muhammad Arshad. Uh, before we start, allow me to introduce our keynote speaker to you. Um, Professor Datin Paduka uh, Fatima Arshad is currently a research fellow at the University of Putra Malaysia, specializing in agriculture marketing and policy analysis. Uh, she is currently a member of the country's National Agriculture Advisory Council to the Ministry of Agriculture and Food Industry, and also the head Agriculture and Food Security Cluster 
Academy of Professors Malaysia, and also senior fellow at Institute for Democracy and Economic Affairs or IDS uh, from Kuala Lumpur. Uh, her research areas include uh, agriculture marketing and economic issues, policy analysis, and agriculture market structure. She has carried out various policy research studies, particularly on the role of agricultural subsidies and incentives in the oil palm, paddy, and rice industry. Um, Professor Dati Paduka Fatima has developed a vintage model for estimating oil palm production and modeling of the paddy and rice sector in Malaysia. Um, and she believes that the role of the smallholders in agriculture can be further enhanced through knowledge empowerment and treating the path of collaborative commons, particularly cooperative for sustainability, equity and growth, something that I believe everybody can agree on. So without further ado, I would like to invite Yang Berbahagia, Professor Datin Paduka Fatima Muhammad Arshad to take the stage for her keynote presentation with the title Malaysia's Food Security Post-Pandemic Towards Self-Reliance and Sustainability. Please welcome Datin. Assalamualaikum. Waalaikumsalam Dati. Ya, yeah. uh, boleh nampak ke saya punya PowerPoint? Uh, Dati dah, uh, have you make it a slide show? Ya, yeah, dah. Sudah. Okay. Tak, tak nampak lagi ya? You cannot see? Ya, yeah, uh, I can see it now. Ya, yeah, okay. Is it is it clear over there? Is it clear? Yes, yes. Okay. Can I start now? All right. Is it clear now? Yes, please, I think. Okay, all right. Okay. Assalamualaikum and a very good morning, everyone. Uh, so, uh, I'm very sorry for the glitches. I didn't expect my laptop to betray me. Normally, my laptop is very efficient. Uh, before I start, I would like to acknowledge the uh, the hard work of uh, Professor Nick Marzuki, Dr. Noor Hafizo, uh, Prof. Dr. Uh, yeah, uh, Dr. Nick Mazuki and of course the Deputy Minister Yang Berhormat Datuk Haji Cik Abdullah bin Mat Nawi and of course Professor Dr. Arham Abdullah and all of you who have worked hard for this seminar and not forgetting my good friend uh, uh, Associate Professor Amizi. I've uh, met him a few times but I was impressed with him. Uh, he's uh, such a cheerful person and he's committed to his work. I would like to dedicate this keynote to Professor Azimi. Me, uh, my, uh, my, my uh, doa al uh, fatiha for from Azimi. All right, guys. Uh, the the keynote theme that uh, that was assigned to me is Malaysia's security post pandemic towards self reliance and sustainability. So the lines of discussion today is I would like to give you the big picture and system view. System view means the, the interconnected elements in food security and our status with regards to food security. And of course, looking at the uh, uh, pillars of food security, availability, affordability, nutrition, as well as resi re re sorry, resiliency and sustainability. And of course, way forward. Right. Uh, uh, okay. Uh, Please remember that food security is a global affair, right? The first line is global. From global, it is dependent on national and national dependent on household. Household refers to all of us. And at the household level, it means the uh, the accessibility, the nutrition, the basic needs of our people. And then uh, from there, you can zero in into the nutrition security of uh, every individual. This diagram shows that we cannot uh, 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 we cannot avoid to be dependent on national, regional, as well as global, because this is a uh, this is a affair of the world, uh, which can be translated into various levels. Yeah, and uh, when one talk about food security, is as you can see from this diagram, of course the pillars are assess uh, accessibility here, and of course availability and utilization or nutrients, but those factors or these pillars are determined by a number of factors. Say, for example, production will uh, will be uh, 
uh, affecting food availability as well as excess income prices and so on and utilization depending on the quality the dietary intake the cultural factor the health status and so on so uh, what this diagram uh, is trying to show food security is not about food eating food excess of food but the whole system yeah from the political uh, um, policy environment as well as the broad environment social economic environment that determines this the production as well as uh, uh, all the pillars of food security right i would like to introduce to you uh, the relationship between shocks so in this case what we had the whole world had the covid 19 shocks and how it has affected food security and mind you uh, these variables, so these elements are interconnected in terms of circular manner or in a feedback relationship. Say, for example, we have the shocks and we have the MCO and that have, has affected supply chain and that affected availability of food as well as loss of income because of no job. And because of that, uh, it affected the affordability and therefore the food insecurity among the poor and therefore affecting the vulnerability of the people and when they are vulnerable they are also uh, easily susceptible to further shocks or further uh, uh, COVID syndrome so they are all interrelated and as you can see how MCO as well as lockdown has affected economic performance it has uh, caused a slowdown in economics and because of the economics is slowing down therefore it is affecting income and therefore poverty therefore nutrition security therefore their ability their affordability as well as availability of food and it affects that food insecurity and it goes back to the uh, uh shock problem again so uh, please have the, this view because uh, this is the actual uh, uh, uh situation that the world is uh, the world is experiencing now right both in that i would like to take you to a big picture about malaysia's agriculture and you know very well that because of our colonial masters we have all involved and we have all started with industrial crop as you can see here before in the 60s i think my parents were rubber tappers that was in the 60s and look at rubber area it has uh, gone down what we call it slowly decaying to about 1 million it was about 2 million in the 60s and it was replaced by oil palm which is showing what we call linearly exponential growth right and we have also involved in cocoa but look at cocoa it has uh, what we call it overshoot or it has experienced boom period and therefore now it has uh, more or less collapsing right so we have three archetypes here we call it archetype exponential growth decaying and collapsing right so that is with regards to uh, uh, industrial crops let's look at our pattern of land usage as you can see here this is the land usage usage here so for up sorry for food it has reduced from about one third in 1980s to about 10 percent now but look at oil palm 73 percent of land usage is devoted to oil palm and rubber has reduced to about half to 16 percent but if you look at this graph in terms of value added Food product, food commodities accounted for 10%, but in terms of value added contribution, ladies and gentlemen, it's about 42%. And look at oil palm, it accounted about three quarters of land area, but contribution to value added is 44%. What it shows is that the return to land or value added to land for food is much higher than oil palm. Oil palm is, uh, is doing well because they depend on area expansion so what has happened in the past is that our policy biases toward industrial crops has resulted in a slow growth of food it is land intensive but lower value added per hectare food crops area is declining but value added increases and fisheries if you look at this data and vegetables have higher value added right so based on that let's look at uh, our food security status so this is basically our self-sufficiency level as a proxy, yeah, as an indication of our, our self-sufficiency situation. All right. So this is in general our performance. Not very uh, uh, optimistic because as you can see, uh, except for eggs and poultry meat and pork meat, the rest of the commodities, we are low in terms of self-sufficiency, yeah, be it, uh, be it fruits or vegetables or meat or milk as well as dairy products yeah but the, this is because consumption grows faster than production 
and therefore we need to depend on import to meet local demand. In terms of uh, import dependence, there you are. All right. Except for poultry meat, the rest of the items, not only food items. Let's look here. The red marks are the the uh, the deficits. So cocoa, sugar, fruits, vegetables, cereals, fish, eggs, meat, yeah, live animals, as well as uh, uh, input, yeah. As you can see here, three point nine billion. We imported our feedstock for animals three point nine billion in nineteen twenty. Uh, this is data for 2018, right? So the same thing with cereals, the same thing with dairy products, the same thing with uh, uh, wheat and as well as uh, uh, fertilizer and so on. So that's the status of uh, our uh, food sector in the country. So I post a question here. We can afford to import, but we can't afford to produce locally. So this is a question that we must uh, ponder. Why are we important, uh, importing and why can't we produce uh, locally? Okay, demand is growing, beef, vegetables, uh, except for rice is declining, per, per, per capita consumption of fruits is supposedly declining. I, I, I disagree with this data because I think uh, the consumption is rising. And this is what happened uh, under COVID or under pandemic. All of you are aware of this in terms of, say, for example, this was in July 2020s it was at the peak of a pandemic yeah so we have a, a situation loss of jobs loss of income and of course uh, uh, talika says is becoming active and so on so uh, the, the 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 economy has has uh, has affected very badly yeah all right uh, okay this is what happened yeah what happened on the pandemic Right. So this is with regards to supply chain. All of us went through this, and this was uh, the situation uh, uh, when when we had pandemic. Yeah. For example, we had problem with the uh, uh, supply of food because we have closed down our wholesale market. Right. Wholesale market. We have. Uh, curtail or control movement of input and this has resulted in a short period uh, uh, lack of supply and then we only open up hyper market as a result our small retailers pasamalam and so on was was marginalized and uh, and as a result of that there are thousands of them and they become out of job and they become uh, you know uh, with limited income and was affected by by pandemic right so this is a big lesson that we learned from uh, from uh, uh, pandemic as well as lockdown so these are very worrying studies from Bengdagara. Yes, seventy-five percent of us find it a challenge to raise one thousand ringgit for emergencies. So it is proven during the pandemic. Yeah, about one third of Malaysians can only cover a week's worth of expenses should they lose their source of income. Yeah, and most of them have lost their source of income. So can imagine that their their life, you know, and their family and the nutrients to the children. And this is a study. All of you must read this. <coughs> Excuse me. I have appended in in the in the appendix. UNICEF study, twenty nineteen. One in three has no social safety net, leaving them vulnerable to economic shocks. One in three earns le earn less than two k a month. And three quarter, which is very much in line with the uh, Ben Nagara's uh, finding, household have no savings. So you can imagine their their uh, their pain and suffering during the uh, pandemic or the MCO. This is the recent one. Also, please look at this as well. They study a Pratt dwellers in KL. The average income is less than two k. Household member is five point eight. And there are some uh, very worrying information such as uh, this one. Yeah. 60% experience reduction in monthly income, half employed head of household do not have labor market protection, household spend less in education 84%, rent 40%, transport 40%, and food minus 4%, and then three in four unable to save, and uh, uh, some uh, data on low ranking servants, government servants, 20% of total were unable to save any money during the pandemic time right so this is another worrying uh, 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 trend during pandemic on average households consume more eggs and instant noodle 40 percent eggs about 50 percent rice increase 40 percent but less on fruits yeah which is important for the uh, diets yeah 
and then uh, these are the worrying trend, particularly on the uh, they couldn't find uh, uh, receive medical assistance. Twenty nine percent household contain members with chronic diseases, and one in ten children have three less than three meals a day. One in two do not have enough money to buy food, and malnourishment is a major concern in Malaysia. One in five is stunted, and one in ten is under underweight. Right there, you are. Children stunted by states. This is studied by by uh, UNICEF, yeah, which is uh, uh, which is frightening. Nearly 30% of our children between 5 to 19 are obese. Compared to Hungary, Turkey, Poland, stunted children in Putrajaya, one in four, Klantan, one in three, worse than Zimbabwe and Swaziland. So that is uh, also shocking. Malnutrition among children be age below five between Malaysia, KL, and low cost flats. So you can see it's more than, uh, it's about two digits except for uh, Kuala Lumpur, right? So that's the situation. Right. So, uh, where do we go from here? Going back to the system view, let me uh, uh, give you the perspective. The interrelationship between policy. If you, if you institute growth induced policy, you can see the chain of effect along the industry. Okay, let me, let me take you this path. Growth induced policy will, will lead to economic growth. Therefore, higher income. Therefore, higher food production therefore leads to better availability leads to better affordability income to consumers leads to better affordability better nutrition uh, security and therefore better food security if you have better food security we produce uh, uh, healthy human capital better growth for our children better opportunities for education they become uh, good quality human capital and that is good for the whole economy so I hope you can see the system view or the interconnectedness of the various elements in there or what we call circular causality between all these variables, right? Okay, so uh, this is my view about our, our food security. And as you can see, whether it's pandemic or during peacetime, food is needed during good or bad times. It is forever needed by all of us. Right. So based on my experience uh, for the past 40 years, based on my work, I would propose the following lines. Yeah. Number one, uh, we require a shift or shift in policy or shift in paradigm in terms of our policy approach. Number one, I would propose since rubber is declining, cocoa has more or less collapsed and oil palm will reach its ceiling in 2023. Uh, uh, area ceiling 6.5 million hectare. So uh, the prospect for industrial crop in this country is more or less uh, 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 left only with oil farm. Once, once it reaches 6.5 million hectare, it might uh, maintain a constant level or it might go down. We don't know because Indonesia is uh, coming up very fast and of course some African country. So our prospect with regards to industrial crop in the primary production is uh, uh, not that good. Therefore, I would suggest that with all the richness that we have, biodiversity, good land, good sunshine, good uh, uh, rain, as well as uh, with ICT, when, uh, and, and as well as our young, young generation with their capacity with regards to you know inter artificial intelligence, drone, and all this technology, they can improve our food production. So I would propose that we institute food first policy. That means we channel our dedication in terms of uh, resources, uh, research, as well as uh, allocation towards development of food sector in the country so that we, we would become as good as Thailand as well as Vietnam. That means more budget allocation for incentive and R, D, and E. I emphasize the word E, that is extension. Yeah, In this country, uh, remember the, uh, the, minist the Ministry of Agriculture in Thailand is Ministry of Agriculture and Extension. So we can see that the importance of extension in Thailand, uh, Thailand agriculture. And I will also propose to, to, uh, to restructure our R&D and extension agenda, right, in food, we, uh, because I don't think uh, Mari can handle all, right? Because because when you talk about food commodities, we have paddy, we have uh, vegetables, and there are many vegetables there, not mentioning our fruits because we are very rich in biodiversity, right? So we have durian, we have rambutan, we have chepada, we have rambai, 
what have you. So each of these commodity need research uh, on, on its own. I don't think Mardi is uh, is uh, can handle that. And therefore, I would recommend uh, more universities and colleges uh, involved in the uh, R&D for these commodities, not machining livestock, yeah, ruminant, non-ruminant. We have uh, cows, we have, uh, uh, you know, poultry, we have pork and so on, so, as well as uh, ducks. So each one of them requires a separate uh, research agenda. The, the same thing with fisheries, right? Fisheries, we have aquaculture and uh, marine, and as well as food base agro base as uh, as uh, as your faculty faculty's name uh F, i think among the food sector fmb food and beverages are the most uh, the most dynamic one and uh, i have seen many young people have gone into food and beverages either online such as you know uh, they have come up with uh, say uh, cocoa cocoa drinks or coffee and, and so on so the pr prospect is, is is very good and of course digitalization we are way way behind our neighbors compared to thailand with regards to digitalization using of drones or using of a various application you know, internet of thing or or uh, you know blockchain and many many applications which are which are there and not being uh, translated into the farm so these are the prospects for us. And remember what FAO said, or even uh, Institute of Food Production Production Research Institute in America, or even uh, uh, IFAD. They said that almost 60% of future yield or productivity comes from R&D. And IFRI, yeah, uh, IFRI Institute of Food and Production Research Institute in the US said that the number one driver of uh, food security as well as poverty reduction, number one is R&D. Number two is infrastructure. So for Malaysia to, to, you know, to have a, a dynamic growth in food production, we have to beef up our R&D in the future. And we, we are not going to start from zero because we have Thailand, we have India, we have China. Who, have, who are excel, they have excelled so much and we can learn from them. Yeah? Uh, we don't have to go, we have, don't have to look uh, at the advanced country. We just have to look at our neighbors, Taiwan, Thailand, Vietnam, China, or even India with regards to biotech as well as digitalization. And I believe in uh, uh, providing more incentive to SME as well as start up in food manufacturing, particularly FMB. And I believe if we have a very dynamic FMB, it can, it can function as an influencer or as a driver to improve the production of primary supplies such as food, uh, vegetables, fruits, coffee, cocoa, and so on to, to, to feed or to support the uh, SME as well as uh, food and beverages. And I will also propose zero food waste uh, policy. I think Taiwan did this and they have successfully uh, converted those uh, food waste towards uh, uh, fertilizer and other uses. And Bangkok, I'm, I am I'm quite aware. I mean, I, I have seen that they have uh, uh, what they call it uh, transformed the food waste towards uh, organic organic fertilizer and of course recycling. And I like this concept, which is which was introduced by Tun Raza uh, Buku Hijau, meaning uh, meaning that whatever soil that we have, whatever space that we have, we devote it to pro uh, production right either uh, behind our house or in front of our house or neighborhood or green book or urban farming or vertical farming and better still community-based farming meaning the whole community work together uh, to uh, to to plan either using uh, uh, you know modern technology vertical farming so that you know you, at least you can come up with a, a health health healthy fresh and fresh vegetables uh, for your families and for the community and uh, there are many technologies there. I think Singapore is doing this. They have come up with a technology to uh, towards vertical farming as well as integrated uh, uh, aquaculture in the city, right? So uh, it can be done. So uh, it is not a rocket science. The technology is there is about getting it and implement it uh, to the community. Yeah? This can be done in the urban area as well as better still in, in the rural area. And guys, you have seen earlier, uh, let, let me say this, not many people know that the one the reason that our sector, our food sector is not performing is because number one, yield is not very high, all right? And number two, our 
Input costs are very high. You know why? Because we import almost all items of input. Let me list down to you. Fertilizer, pesticide, weed decide, herbicide. We couldn't afford to produce locally. Therefore, we import. Therefore, this is expensive. Seeds, seeds for corn, seeds for other products as well, for vegetables are imported. Bucker, breeds also imported. Our machine, our rice harvester, or all the machines at the farm level are all imported. Feedstock for livestock, all are imported. And I forgot to mention the labor. We imported them from Indonesia, from, uh, from Bangladesh, and so on. So can you imagine our yield is not very low. Our cost of production continues to increase because we depend on import. So it's about time Malaysia start to look at, uh, you look at their own capacity to produce local input. And we have biomass. If you go to Pasar Selayang or Pasar, uh, Pasar Borong, you can see so much, so much vegetables are thrown to the, to the roadside when this uh, waste or food waste or biomass can be transformed into organic fertilizer. The same thing with paddy farm. The jerami can be used for organic fertilizer and so on. So all these years, we have ignored the richness that we have and we would rather import rather than coming up with our own input sector development. I think in Thailand, let, let me say this, in Thailand, the, uh, the yield of rice is not as high as us. We are about average or about four ton per hectare. Theirs, uh, theirs is about two or three ton per hectare. But they produce high quality rice and their cost of production is low. You know why? Because they produce their own import. Uh, sorry, their own input. I think about 30 to 40 percent are local, but the rest they are all imported. At least they can produce their own. The same thing with Vietnam, uh, they produce their own uh, input locally. So that's why they are able to reduce their cost of production. Plus, their uh, uh, Vietnam, their cropping intensity is 3.7, and it seems I heard they are able to produce rice variety every month. To that extent, right. There you are, guys. Uh, 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 those were my thoughts based on my observation as well as my study. These are the what we call the academic or the uh, uh, recipe had, that has been proposed by World Bank as well as uh, FAO as, uh, as well as IFAD. So uh, as you can see, it's quite comprehensive. Basically, it's about maintaining the producers to have enough margin or enough income so that they are able to produce. As I always said in my, in my, in my work, unless or until the producers are self-sufficient, we cannot reach self-sufficiency for the country. They are the pillars of our production. Therefore, you need to ensure that they have uh, enough in infrastructure, they have enough uh, input, they have enough access to assets, land, rural finance, labor, right? And everything. And say, for example, revitalize our livestock sector and so on. So it is a comprehensive uh, 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 policy to ensure uh, uh, food security uh, will be achieved uh, for the country, right? Say, for example, uh, with regards to resource conservation, seed, yes, yeah, seed uh, and input relief, livestock capital, uh, market revival, and so on, right? And of course, uh, cash, cash, uh, uh, put a cash base transfer for the for the poor, and so on. So this is a recipe which is a uh, 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 comprehensive to ensure food security for the country. And look at this community based farming. This is not new in the West. They have started this, but Malaysia is still uh, limited. And I think uh, urban farming can can help induce uh, community based farming. Yeah. And all this uh, uh, with regards to, say, for example, natural resource management and zero food waste, there you are, circular economy, low carbon water footprint and so on. So uh, I know this is uh, difficult, but we have to do it. Right. When it comes to uh, resiliency and so on, we, it is back to, to the farmers. Look, income and saving, assets and capital, production and efficiency, and of course, their behavior in terms of, you know, risk attitude and so on. Right. Also, with regard to nutrition, it's about child malnutrition, household hunger score, as well as uh, uh, whether they have enough uh, uh, adequate food, food consumption, dietary diversity, and so on. So they are all inter interconnected. With that, I end my presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Latin Professor Paduka, for the very interesting presentation. Uh, there are so many things that 
new to me that I haven't heard. For example, um, uh, statistics in terms of uh, food, first, uh, food first policy and so forth. Uh, so for the discussion, I'm, I'm very interested when you say that uh, in Malaysia, uh, you, you, when you show us about the conceptual framework of food security, there are multiple levels on the, on the global levels uh, and the regional levels and local. So uh, during this pandemic, um, do you think the strategy uh, to ensure food security, is it better for us to focus on collaborative efforts for example, among these smaller countries, for example, in Southeast Asia, to collaborate together, or is it better for the country to focus on inside the country and work in silo? Okay, that's a good question. All right. Everybody tells me, why, why do we need to worry? Look at Singapore, you know. Uh, they are number one with regards to global food security index. But my, in my opinion, we are not Singapore, right? We are not that rich as Singapore, right? Plus, our country is very rich in biodiversity. Not many people know about this, but we are number two in the world with regards to biodiversity. You just name it, any fruits or any, any vegetables, we have a number of varieties which we did not explore and we did not attempt to enhance the usage of these uh, 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 plants that we have in the forest or even in front of our house, right? So, uh, uh, as I said earlier, in terms of resources, land water sunshine sunshine we have plenty and how come we are still depending on import for food let me tell you uh malaysia depends on uh, we have ap to import cabbages do you know that to that extent don't tell me that we can't afford to produce our own cabbages you know so uh, i think uh self resil uh, resilience yeah self-reliant is still important because this is food and food is not about you know having enough food but also nutrition for our children right so uh, during pandemic we can see that the poor uh, you can see that their dietary has changed please read the report by unicef as, as well as the, the the report that i mentioned earlier the impact on the low income is very very serious imagine they don't have income for three months three to four months even with the with the help of the government it is in, it's not enough to buy quality food and this has affected the, the the growth of the children they are already stunted so between three four months they didn't have a good nutrition they are eating eating uh, noodles you know every day maggie me every day so which is not good for them and not mentioning they don't have access to a computer for, for learning and so on eh? so i do believe that we must have some level of uh, self-reliant in food because i think we can do it right if you are able to be successful in oil palm cocoa and rubber why not food and it has been proven in other countries like thailand right or, or, or in vietnam for example within a short period where numbers increase their their yield from three ton to, to six to eight ton within 15 years and look at us we have increased our subsidy tripling yeah triple from half of half a billion before 2007 we increase it to two billion now but the yield has not improved it has remained around about four ton per hectare so something something is is is, is not right there uh all i'm saying is uh there are many benefits or multifunctional benefits investing in food all right number one it utilizes enhances our our biodiversity it dynamizes our rural rural uh, or rural economy or kampung and so on it is dynamic because it provides jobs to many people it is much more equitable we produce uh, uh, smes like uh, like traders like push production in small scale which is good which is which is dynamic and not mentioning the ecological benefit of uh, small farms right because farmers by having small farm they are very caring with regards to their surrounding compared to estates right estate they have hundreds or uh, thousands of hectares and they, they they kind of you know uh, uh, it is it's a flat land you know and they, they not to say i don't know to use the word uh, damaging the biodiversity as well as the flora and fauna but the small farms it is you it is good for ecological benefit because of they take care of their environment so so uh, uh the the future of food is as i said 
it is needed in good time and bad time and it has many many uh, advantages to 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 uh, to, to the population especially household thank you okay and then Dr. Lu, so you also mentioned about digitalization so as you are aware that in Malaysia we are moving towards uh, IR 4.0 you know the government policy of talking about IR 4.0 we have NJEP uh, who are championing IR 4.0 especially in agriculture but uh, when we compare with uh, Malaysia and Singapore, for example, or other European countries, um, the adoption of technology among farmers in Malaysia is still low. Uh, even from my own experience, uh, most of these small farmers, they don't even know how to use fertigation or drip, drip irrigation. That is very basic. They have been around for 10 of, 10 of years. So why is there? Why is there? How do we bridge this, this gap, the technology? Is it, is it because it's too expensive? Is it because of uh, lack of awareness or what do you think? Yeah, okay. Uh, it's, it's a very tough question, but I can answer it uh, by uh, by mentioning the three ways. Yeah, the three ways. Number one is the human way. Number two is the hardware. And number three is the software. And the linkage between all these three aspects are the extension agent, yeah, as the uh, uh, transfer of knowledge from from MDEC from university to the farmers uh, are, are required, right? So when we talk about human way, all right, maybe un unlike India, India produced uh, many many years ago. I read in one magazine, India produced seventy six thousand engineers a year. That was in nineteen, if I'm not mistaken, early early two thousand something. You know, so uh, and Vietnam too. Yeah. Uh, one thing about Vietnam is that uh, uh, they were saying that the cheapest subject, the cheapest academic subject is mathematics, right? Because it only requires brain and and pencil, right? For poor countries. Uh, mathematics is good. So these are the things that, that, that create, uh, that supports the uh, the human capital with regards to innovation in terms of ICT. We need the people with the right skill, with the right technology to come up with ideas and innovation. Okay, so that's one. And then the hardware, right? I think it is good that the government is going into the uh, uh, rolling out the 5G. Uh, in the next coming years. So we need 5Gs and you know very well China has into it, has rolled out their 5Gs and you know the the, the industry is booming, 5G and everything. And of course uh, the software. This is also uh, is important. Where are the apps? Where are the innovation needed? All right? So it's not happening. So I don't have answer but if you ask me, is the I, I've seen a, uh, one example of one project in Thailand where three parties are involved. Number one is the researchers from university. Number two are the government represented by uh, the uh, extension agent. Number three are the farmers themselves. So there are a uh, strong collaboration between the farmers and the researchers helped by the agencies, the research, uh, sorry, the agent, uh, the agent of extension. To decide what are the applicability applicable uh, applications that are, that are needed by by the farmers, so it's the farmers who tell the researchers what are his problem, and the research, researchers have to think ways or, or or innovation that are needed to solve his problem. Right? Say, for example, um, let me tell you. I mean, I, I did propose with regards to the uh, problem of. Uh, uh, cartel with regards to livestock, right? Where where all of us are eating uh, daging kuda and daging daging yeah, uh, yeah. uh, Okay, so I have proposed something, something, uh, something like a, a blockchain. Blockchain in the blockchain. sense that yeah, we have a big data of all the participants involved, but be mm. it producer or trader or exporter or importer, they log in, they log in into the system, and they, they mention their quantity or timing, the quality, the grades, and the prices, and so on. At least we have that data. Once we have that data, then we are able to monitor. At least we minimize us, minimize us, uh, uh, cheating or minimize us or whatever they do now. So blockchain is, is quite a good technology to ensure uh, transparency and fairness to everyone. Of course, this is a uh, uh, blockchain is uh, very difficult to understand, but as you mentioned, if we don't do it, we'll be lagging behind. So as, uh, uh, as uh, the answer for this is everyone has to be involved from the government to the researchers to extension agent as well as farmers. Otherwise, we'll be lagging behind uh, 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 compared to our neighbors. 
So yeah. remember the three yeah. words, yeah. Okay, thank you. <laughs> I believe uh, I love it when you said when you when you said about collaborative. Yes, because yes. I, I believe that uh, the future is collaborative. You know, you have to collaborate to to you know secure your future because now nowadays people cannot work in silo anymore. Everything yes, you have yeah. to collaborate with each other. Yeah. yeah so yeah. Okay. When, when we talk about yeah yeah Latin, please go. Ahead. Yeah, I, I would like to. Uh, 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 bring to you the concept of grab yeah grab food yes grab taxi it's not very uh, uh how to say you know high level concept right yeah. it's very simple but it's the way they mobilize the technology to 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 enable that so something like that right so i don't know it, it's not <laughs> it's not uh, very complicated but uh, but we have to be innovative in coming up with ideas that to help yeah. the farmers. And farmers have many, many problems too. Early warning system, the water level, the uh, uh, to, to monitor the uh, the what do you call it, the age of the trees, the pH level of the the soil, the water content of the plants, right? And yeah, the yeah. price trend, who are the buyers, who are the sellers? There's so much uh, problems there, and I'm sure uh, those things uh, can be done and can be solved with IT. Uh, do you think that, do you think the, the the lacking is because of uh, less of or lacking of incentive? Meaning that they have the technology but they don't want to do it because yeah. the major player don't see the incentive in doing that. Yeah, the incentive, uh, as well as you know, I I think I I read a case. You know, I read a case. This guy he is Filipino, and he studied under MDEC. And, uh, and I don't know what program, but it, it is all for startup, you know. So he he had he attended courses there, courses there, and then he went home. He went home. He start he he start up crowdfunding for agriculture. Okay. Yes, he developed that apps, and it, it, it involves the various uh, farmers and so on, and then he's doing well. So, you know, that kind of thing, crowdfunding for agriculture, that's new, and then okay. uh, I think. Um, I have proposed in the case remember a paddy deduction there's so mm. so so many complaints that is 30 percent even in kada is 45 percent so to me the answer to that is databases databases as well as uh, apps that uh, connect uh, all the producers to the buyers mm. and burners so that we, they can see who 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 gets uh, how much deduction you know so by having that data so nobody is there to to charge higher than 20 uh, percent so you, know you, you mean? increase so, you increase the transparency of the supply chain. Yes, yes, yes. Okay. Yeah. So yeah. when when we're talking about the transparency of the supply chain, we have one question from Dr. Raimi on on Facebook. So yeah. she was talking about uh, the middleman. Uh, how mm -hmm. can we reduce the impact of middleman? Because in agriculture supply chain, when we talk about middleman, middlemen have this uh, very negative, very negative perception, right? When we talk about okay. of this middleman is uh, you know are going to take all this profit and then the farmers are going to to take to take only like a very little profit at the end of the day. So, yeah, so how yeah, do we yeah. reduce the impact of middleman to improve the value of the food crop for the betterment okay. of the food farmer? Okay, I, I like that question. All right, uh, okay. Uh, I think our man mentor has uh, instituted a program, uh, jihad orang tengah, yeah. But yes, the truth I is. Yeah, yes. The truth is, you can ne you can never do without it, without orang tengah. Even yes. if you abolish them, you still need orang tengah, right? When you buy from, uh, say, Shopee or from Lazada, you think there's no orang tengah, there will be orang tengah. Or even when you yeah. nak kahwin pun, you still have orang tengah, you know, to, to, yes. to relay the message to the, to the exactly. other party. Yes. Yeah. So you cannot uh, uh, delete the role of a uh, uh, middleman. It can be in terms of uh, postman, post office are middleman, right? or uh, stock it, uh, stockies, they are middlemen too. All right. So yeah. I have a good news here. Uh, uh, the minimum number of cooperative members now has been reduced to from 50 to 20. Oh, okay. Yes, I have uh, I have proposed five. Nanti, nanti I, I forward kat you. Oh, yeah, five. I give it to, uh, right. uh, yeah. I proposed five, but uh, they were uh, scared. So they reduced it to 20. So uh, with 20, farmers can work together. Yes. Uh, we can learn from, okay, uh, I have two answers. Yeah? Number one, farmers work together, either cooperative or association. Uh, the farmers in Cameron mm. Highland, 
they work through their association. They have producer association, they have wholesaler association, they have uh, exporter association. So they work together, you know. They work together, say for example, or even uh, remember barber association pun ada, tukang gunting pun ada association, so that they can work together as one. So for farmers, yes, collaborative. I, I believe in collaborative, right? So when Uber was introduced, remember? When Uber was first introduced, it's collaborative commons all over the world. Ha, to that extent. So uh, I, I agree with you, collaboration is important. So for farmers, number one, they can they can do it by, by, by cooperative. But when we say cooperative, and then the government will say, oh, we have cooperative already, we have farmer association. But farmer association, we follow the, the, the Taiwanese model and look what happened to us. Taiwanese doing so well, <laughs> we are still uh, lagging behind. So I think cooperative uh, can, can do wonders. Uh, tonight, maybe uh, some of you check the annual cooperatives in India. It started way back in the 70s. Even if you have one car, you can become a, a member for annual cooperative, which is dairy cooperative. And now they become giant of, uh, of the world. In 1960s, India was a major importer of milk. And now India is number two with regards to exports of milk, all because of yes. true cooperative. So the prospect is yes. there. So, so good news from 50 to 20. Yeah, so through cooperatives, we can bypass a middleman, all right? So what I have in mind is forward integrated cooperatives, meaning this cooperative will buy small meals if they can, right? So uh, with their money or capital, they can buy small meals, they can process, therefore they can bypass a middleman, they can internalize any reduction in price and they can sell a uh, uh, processed product, all right? That's one way. Or also backward integrated where they are also involved in say for example baja itu yang I nak baja tu baja whatever they can they can be involved in that business. Tapi di Malaysia ni baja bawa rista baja bawa nafas. There's no room for farmers to to expand beyond their farms. Can you see that? Yeah. Yeah. Ah yeah. 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 uh, rista yeah. control untuk kita nafas untuk control untuk padi. Jadi apa peluang petani? So we must open that open that to the farmers. Okay, that's one. Number two is of course e-commerce. And you know very well in pandemic e-commerce uh, was the champion. Uh, that help us to access to food and e-commerce okay that requires uh, uh, as, as you have mentioned software and hardware and as well as application and I, I believe uh, that the youngs are doing that so as you say we need more incentive uh, more more subsidies I, I don't mind that subsidies to the young to get into the into the e-commerce uh, in agriculture thank you okay okay very interesting session bro uh, I would like to ask a lot more questions, but no uh, yeah, because the time, uh, you know, always jealous of us. So we have to uh, stop here. Maybe after after the pandemic, the lockdown is over. Maybe we can sit down together, yeah. have a cup okay. of coffee, we discuss together in UPM okay. one day. So uh, on, <laughs> on behalf of the organizer, I would like to thank Yang uh, berbahagia Datin Paduka, uh, Professor Fatimah Muhammad Arshad once again for the very insightful input, presentation and discussion. So uh, the questions that we were not able to ask Datin uh, on the chat are going to relate to you personally and then we get back to the participants. So uh, with this, I end this session, the keynote uh, presentation and once again, thank you very much Datin and all the participants. Get back to the organizer. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye. Ladies and gentlemen, this opening ceremony has now come to the end. On behalf of the committee, I would like to extend my utmost appreciation to our guests of honour. I would also like to take this opportunity to extend my appreciation to individuals who have been involved in making this virtual conference a success. Most importantly, on behalf of University of Malaysia Kelantan, I would like to wish the participants of ARCOF 2021 a meaningful and productive day ahead. I am glad to remind the participants again that we are now having parallel session until 3 p.m. today. On this note, I would also like to remind all the participants that we will have a prize giving ceremony for best oral presenters during the closing ceremony. Hence, I would like to invite all of the participants to be at the closing ceremony at 3 p.m. today. With that, I end our opening ceremony this morning with Wabilahi Taufiq Wahidaya. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh.